the great pleasure uh, to, to welcome Eva Marovic from Slovenia. Um, she teaches contemporary philosophy in the Department of Philosophy at the University in Slovenia. And she's also the founding coordinator of the new graduate interdisciplinary program in theoretical psychoanalysis in the Faculty of Arts at the same university. She has published uh, uh, two books um, and uh, many articles, and uh, she's uh, uh, particularly interested in women's studies. So I'm looking forward very much to hear what she says today, because she gave yesterday a brilliant paper at the Klein Lacan Dialogue. She's been interviewed by my old friend Bernard Borgoy, who was a founding member of the but possibly more importantly, he was a founding member of the Center for Freudian Analysis and Research, and um, until recently <coughs> he uh, was organized, and he was director of an MA at Middlesex University. He's also uh, uh, published extensively in psychoanalysis. Um, I ask Bernard to uh, introduce the dialogue. Eva, could we start by your telling us something about the history of your involvement with psychoanalysis? It is related to my university studies at the Faculty of Arts, University of Ljubljana, where I studied uh, philosophy and psychology as parallel studies and uh, it was quite tricky actually since uh, psychology studies were somehow not so much concentrating on Freud. Actually uh, the empirical psychology prevailed and Freud seemed to be part of history. But uh, the philosophy studies were quite different. Actually, uh, Freud figured as one of the main figures in history of uh, uh, Marxist studies. It was actually uh, the time of socialism, and during that time, of course, the philosophy studies were very much oriented and concentrate, concentrated on Karl Marx, but uh, not the Soviet type Marxism, to use Herbert Marcuse's word. Uh, so actually it was very important to have the opportunity to turn to the Frankfurt School in Germany, where uh, Marxist studies were very much related to psychoanalytic studies. So actually, that was uh, a major break in our country and also a major break for all of us. So psychoanalysis actually uh, was not something which uh, was uh, supposed to be um, something good or uh, it was, you know, in most of the East European countries, psychoanalysis was uh, supposed to be part of Western bourgeois ideology. That was the problem. And uh, in Yugoslavia, Slovenia used to be part of Yugoslavia at that time, that was not the case. At least when I started the studies. <laughs> and it was an extremely important thing for us to have this possibility of opening up Marxist thinking and of, uh, of um, opposing some kind of mainstream ideologies of the time. And of course we were all very fond of reading uh, Marx as well as reading Freud and that was our main orientation during that time. And uh, later on, as it happens, as uh, so-called structuralism happened in France, uh, you know, the, the background in, in our country was somehow already prepared. So 
we started to read uh, Jacques Lacan, Claude Lévi-Strauss, Jacques Derrida, Gilles Deleuze, Michel Foucault, Louis Althusser and the others, uh, actually quite soon, much earlier than in other European countries, I think. And this was related to our theoretical journal, Problemi. So paradoxically, in, uh, it actually isn't so much a, of a paradox, given that many psychology departments um, construct psychology in this very uh, empiricist way. You, your access to Freud came through philosophy yeah. department, yeah. and particularly in this problematic of the relation between Freud and Marx. Presumably the philosophy that would focus on is classical German philosophy which is also a, a current of work that would have quite directly influenced Freud. Could you uh, say something about yes, particular uh, philosophers that would be important? Of course, uh, classical German philosophy uh, is part of our philosophy studies. It's always all was, and I think it always will be. It's the main orientation of our intellectual space. And actually, it was very important, um, also from political and, and ideology, ideological point of view, that we had this uh, reading of Marx which was related to Hegel and partly it's, it was also related to the Frankfurt School which I already mentioned, uh, for instance Theodor Adorno and Herbert Marcuse's reading of Hegel, it was also part of our uh, intellectual formation and uh, it was uh, at a certain point it, it somehow seemed to be natural to turn to what was happening in France, uh, despite the fact that uh, Hegel was uh, not, so, uh, not such a central figure for, should I say, French theory? Would that be the best way to describe well, it? Well, actually, <laughs> structuralist development, yes. But yes, structuralist then, development, the there yes. Was, uh, great. And from the 30s, a great influence, a growing influence of Hegel in, in France, yeah, in Paris yeah. in particular. Uh, the situation was really different, you know, if I think of philosophers and psychologists, and it still is today, it still is today. Actually, uh, the other day we had some discussion with uh, one of my friends from the psychology department. Actually, we were sitting together in a commission related to some kind of you know, actually it was a viva and at a certain point he said uh, we're talking about Freud in relation to in relation to the present day theory and the therapy and everything and he said at a certain point Freud is history and I, di I didn't know what to what to think what to say <laughs> it was you know, it was so oppressive, uh, uh, and so, it seemed to be so somehow simple-minded, or how to put it, you know, to uh, all our endeavors, or, or our, our lecturing, uh, everything we try to explain is related to um, uh, try to figure out what uh, was actually the major break related to Sigmund Freud and his name, what was his revolution in science, uh, like what did it mean for our civilization as such, actually it was such a major break that we cannot think of uh, philosophy without him anymore, uh, after, you know, his uh, work. Freud is uh, not just a historical figure, he is a uh, to use uh, Foucault's word, uh, founder of discursivity. We have to keep going back to him and uh, try to find something new there. We cannot read Freud like uh, somebody, uh, I don't know, among so many other scientists. And uh, we cannot divide what is, what is uh, bad in his thinking and what is still alive, what is true and what is 
related to the time in which he was living and to the place and country and so on and so on. So for us it's actually um, really a problem if somebody says something like that. For it is history or it's just fun. <laughs> The psychology colleague is trying to discount Freud and discount history at the same time. He yeah, yeah. hasn't read Marx and doesn't realize that people discount <laughs> history carry on repeating themselves. Yeah. You, you haven't mentioned in this context Kant. Hegel is the person you said. Uh, actually, up. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he Hegel is the main uh, figure. Of course, we always study Kant a lot, but uh, somehow Hegel is uh, considered to be something which really cannot be missed. And uh, of course our reading of uh, Lacan, Jacques Lacan in his French return to Freud, was all the time very much related to Hegel. And it still is, and uh, after years, not to say after decades of, of being part of this, I started to think that perhaps we should also introduce uh, another perspective, which is that of relating Freud to Friedrich Nietzsche. And this relation was very tricky if I may say a word about it. For me, it's really puzzling. I'm working on it presently. It's still a work in progress, but uh, you have this historical fact that Freud was, um, how should I say, afraid to say anything about Nietzsche. He himself considered himself to be so close to Nietzsche that he wouldn't like to have anything to do with him. Uh, if I remember well, there was a special conference, uh, international psychoanalytic conference organized uh, in relation to Nietzsche and Freud was just silent, he remained silent, he didn't want to say anything. Uh, and I think it's something we should also take into account in our philosophical readings of uh, Freud and of course of Lacan. And it, it's amazing that Practically the same or something similar could be noticed in relation to Jacques Lacan, uh, Jacques Lacan as well. You know, it's uh, it's amazing how um, capable he seemed to be of making use of, should I say, all the philosophers from history, philosophy, uh, the way he did it, in a particular way he did it. He took fragments from Aristotle, from Heidegger, from Plato, from. Socrates, from, from everybody actually, but uh, Nietzsche seems to be a kind of blind spot and I wonder <laughs> whether it, it might be kind of, <laughs> I wouldn't like to simplify things, but it might be kind of identification with Freud himself, you know, it, to say nothing about Nietzsche. I've been looking for that for quite some time, you know, there are so many papers on Lacan and all the others, Lacan and Kierkegaard and all the others I mentioned already, but I, I'm not, I have not been able to find anything on this topic, on this particular topic. Uh, I think it's really important because, you know, we have this, uh, how should I say, figures that really don't go together. On the one hand, Hegel, and on the other hand, Nietzsche as two versions of let's say, end of uh, philosophy, and of history of philosophy in the traditional way of doing it. So this is an passion for me. <laughs> Perhaps there's also a too closeness question with Lacan and Nietzsche as well. But yeah, yeah. That research waits to be done. The science you mentioned, um, Freud's revolution in science, and your, your psychology colleagues presumably think that they're being scientific when they're empiricist. And of course there are many other, and probably much richer and more productive um, methodologies and philosophical orientations that one can deploy in, in the science. But how do you see this question of the relation between philosophy and science? 
and possibly the question of the philosophy of science. Is that something that's been worked on, worked on at all in, in the or not? Uh, yeah, actually, the general orientation of uh, teaching philosophy in Ljubljana, at least at the University of Ljubljana, is that we should have um, different approaches and schools and orientations. And I think it's very important. So what we actually have is um, the analytical tradition, what we call the analytical tradition, which is more related to the Anglo-American, Anglo-Saxon world. And then we have uh, what might be called continental tradition, but in two versions. On the one hand, the more Central European German tradition, of course, related to German classical philosophy. And on the other hand, contemporary French philosophy, structuralism, or French theory, or whatever. And in relation to science, um, in the context of uh, analytical philosophy, of course, there's a very strong tradition of um, philosophy of science. And uh, in structuralism, we also somehow endeavor to relate it to scientific tradition, to philosophical scientific tradition from which it actually first emerged, uh, which is called French epistemology. So the names of Gaston Bachelard, uh, Eden Cavalliers, and uh, Georges Canguillem, uh, of course, Alexandre Coyer, but he uh, soon emigrated to the States. Anyway, that tradition was very important for structuralist, structuralist thought, and uh, I think it's very important to keep that in mind all the time and to integrate it into our, should I say, philosophical as well as anti philosophical readings of Freud. If I mention anti philosophy, of course, I refer to Jacques Lacan. Perhaps I should have mentioned that before when I said uh, how fruitfully his um, essays and writings on fragmented <coughs> parts of history and philosophy were. Uh, and, you know, uh, on the other hand, he always defined his own position as anti philosophical. Of course, he had a certain idea, a certain image of philosophy when he was fighting philosophy, opposing philosophy. And uh, science, in relation to that, of course, I mean, you're an expert on that, don't you? I disagree with one of my yes. previous incarnations. Yeah. I wouldn't dare to say anything <laughs> <laughs> about formalization, the Galilean science, and... Saying after not referring is the whole thing. The, this tradition you mentioned of Corvey and, and, and Cavallas and, and the Frankfurt School is something that's largely missing in terms of a framework for psychoanalysis in Britain. On the other hand, um, some good while ago, um, Kant and Hegel, in as far as they influence philosophy in, in Britain, particularly um, Oxford philosophy at the turn of the century and before this linguistic movement, mm -hmm. that certainly influenced people, including Ludwig Dion. And so there are some philosophical antecedents and programs influencing the structuring of psychoanalysis here in Britain but from that tradition, which is different from the one that you're looking at. This question about pro or anti philosophy, there are serious problems that Freud certainly engaged with about the relation between philosophy and science. But if we just focus on that one for a second, it, what does it mean to talk? in Lacan in terms of being an anti-philosopher or not. What are the themes involved there? Well, actually, mm, my impression is that uh, it's actually a very strong word, anti-philosophy. And uh, it's, um, in a way, the whole structuralist movement, as you put it, was anti-philosophical, because uh, it was installed uh, as opposed to what at that time was uh, official French philosophy, which was taught at the universities, and 
Uh, on the other hand, uh, the structuralist movement also started as a kind of opposition to existentialism, to French reception of Heidegger, impersonated in the figure of uh, Jean-Paul Sartre. So it was this double opposition, this <laughs> double anti-philosophical movement, which was already there uh, at the beginning of the structuralist movement. Uh, it was, uh, you know, when I think that uh, when something new emerges, it's always very important to uh, stress the difference, perhaps even exaggerate the difference to what was already there. So, uh, the, in a way, so-called structuralists, which wouldn't name themselves like that, you know, one, one thing is certain, Michel Foucault said, that I am not a structuralist. But anyway, to go back to, to the main uh, problem is that uh, most of them would actually exaggerate in their polemics against Jean-Paul Sartre. And it was a very nice gesture by Gilles Deleuze at a certain moment when he was saying, il a été mon maître, he was my teacher, he was my intellectual authority, how to put it. So you always have this kind of, you know, exaggerations uh, which are necessary to install something new, I think. And on the other hand, you know, it's uh, very important that uh, all these uh, new readings of Freud were not so much embedded in empirical psychology, but in this broader context of philosophical uh, readings and uh, approaches. Of course, now I have to go back since you mentioned uh, Kant in relation to Hegel. In our country, there are a lot of studies uh, bringing Lacan, Lacan together not just with Hegel, but also with Kant. But those would be uh, separate, particular studies. The, the main orientation would actually be Lacan with Hegel. And this, I think, could also be the way to characterize uh, Slava Zizek's work. He does it himself, actually. It's, you know, his uh, main position. Of course, we shouldn't be too schematic about it, so let's go to some other topic. Which <laughs> is sometimes useful, yes, in terms of these isms. Uh, uh, Stalin said he was a Leninist, and yeah. Lenin said he was a Marxist, and, and, and Marx said he wasn't a Marxist, and, and, and Lacan said he wasn't a Lacanian. And it's up to others to be Lacanians. Yeah. But behind all these isms, so are these philosophical programs, and it's becoming much clearer to me now how um, psychological work in Slovenia uh, took its form and took its body of problems from particular philosophical orientations. Can you say something about how Freud, first of all, before Lacan, was taken up within these philosophical programs? What particular themes in Freud's work were focused on? Yeah. Actually, uh, in uh, the context of the Frankfurt School, um, of course, uh, you know, in, in philosophy studies, you always have this central idea of close reading. So the first thing which seemed to be important for us was translating Freud into Slovenian uh, when we started with this new readings of Freud. Uh, there were only scarce translations into our language. So one of our main endeavors was uh, some kind of systematic translations of Freud, of his ma major works, and, uh, and that was really very important. And so we had translated uh, metapsychological essays and uh, his uh, case studies and, and so on and so on. It, it, we made it step by step, but now we're actually very lucky to have a, quite a nice collection of translations of 
most of the basic works, but of course we don't have the, uh, the whole collection. We hope to make it in, in the future. It's an interesting uh, pair of But when I started to study, uh, when I started uh, to study as a student, I was actually reading Freud either in German or in Serbo-Croatian translations, which which we soon discovered uh, they were too superficial. So. <laughs> the super correct thing. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, the English, of course, uh, the, the English uh, translation, the standard edition, is a wonderful one. Uh, 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 with all uh, its apparatus and everything. Mm. It's a very good research. Yeah, yeah. Uh, excellent. Walks and all. Right. Also, the, the problems, there were problems with the French translations, you might have, of course, <laughs> noted yourself. You know, if, if you compare, uh, the situation was quite bad with the French translations of Freud, I think, for, for, for decades. So it's it's very important uh, that now I think it was uh, Jean Laplanche who took over the new edition, which yeah. really seems to be perfectly yeah. That's something much more yeah. much closer yeah. to the standard. But edition. sometimes I was wondering Perhaps. about you know the uh, the translations, uh, people who were working on Freud in France had to rely on it. It was a bit problematic. For instance, one of my uh, suggestions would be that um, the way the five, the, the notion of the five analysis by uh, Freud actually figures in France. It, it, it wouldn't figure like that uh, anywhere else, I think. And it was not Freud's idea. It was not Freud's idea, sorry, to uh, publish the five Cases, the five famous, how should I say, French cases together, you know, Dora and Little Hans and uh, the Red Man case and uh, the Wolf Man case and Schreber. And of course, uh, it, what's missed yeah. out is the analysis of the President of the United States. Yeah. <laughs> Relegated <laughs> to history. <laughs> of course, there's always, you know, if you put things together like that, there's always a problem of. I don't know, omitting something, <laughs> losing something, <laughs> leaving something outside, for instance, the case of female homosexuality. Female and homosexuality might be too much in the same time. I know, I mean, uh, the problem is that, you know, in, one has always to take account of the actual, how should I say, quality and brilliance of Freud's cases and from that perspective, the case of female sexuality, of the young female sexuality, might not be considered to be on the same level as the other five. But on the other hand, this is a new um, way of thinking of Freud, you know. Why should we put the five together? So it figures in, in, in Freud's, I, I wanted to say, in, in France like that, for instance, Alain Badiou in his book 20th Century, the Siècle, where he has put together uh, his series of lecture, lectures he was giving uh, at the turn of the century, and where he has put uh, Sigmund Freud um, in the center of, of these lectures. In the, essay, um, actually in the lecture entitled The Crisis of Psychoanalysis, The Crisis of Sexuality, actually. Uh, he developed whole, his whole point about why uh, Sigmund Freud is so important nowadays, about his courage, about his oppositional thinking. Uh, he started all this uh, from the five cases, and how could we actually explain everything. In the, uh, in the text itself, he then uh, actually omitted the Redman case, which puzzles me very much. <laughs> like that it's something, you know, which seems to be obvious. We have Freud, we have the five cases, and so on. But it, we just wanted to mention it, by the way. This question of vignettes rather than lengthy cases is pertinent to Lacan whose work is full of little vignettes, apart from the any case uh, 
rather than uh, lengthy expositions of text. So there's a question yeah. about presentation and investigation and scientific research when it's the case material. But uh, but you is well, we're talking very contemporary philosophy when we talk about Helen Batty. And there's some further shift going on there. This backcloth of the Frankfurt School and French structuralism is quite clear to me. But now, with French philosophers of the present day, that that represents a different current of ideas, a different research program that psychoanalysis is trying to orientate itself by means of. Yeah. Well, actually, uh, Alain Badiou considers himself to be part of the structuralist movement. Uh, when he describes the situation in France, then he says, uh, he uh, actually talks about all the main figures and then he adds himself, he says, and myself, perhaps. <laughs> so. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, he's one of he's one of the main philosophers of the present day, and um, he's very influential. One of the most influential figures in philosophy nowadays, uh, along with Slavoj Žižek, of course. And I think they actually try to do some things together. Uh, they have special passions now for passion for rethinking communism, and this is uh, seems to be a new passion. Um, I just hope they will not um, discover Stalin as a new <laughs> figure to identify with. <laughs> it's a good point. Well, Zizek always, you know, uh, actually tries to define his own position as being a Stalinist. Uh, it's, of course, it's a joke, but on the other hand, you know, uh, it's part of his rewriting of, of history. Uh, I'm not an expert on Zizek, so I don't teach Zizek studies. <laughs> I wouldn't be able to. But it's very, in very real sense, connected with, with, with politics. Zizek stood for president of, of Slovenia. Uh, yeah, at a, at a certain moment after the fall of the Berlin Wall, we actually appreciated it very much. It was such a nice moment. Yeah. And you got quite a lot of votes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's very. He, actually, Slava Zizek is a, the central figure of uh, our philosophy, our psychoanalysis, our Lacanian school, and. Uh, trademark, how to put it. <laughs> yeah. You several times mentioned we and a, a school constructing a journal. Could you say something about the other people in it? You've mentioned yeah, Zizek, yeah. but uh, uh, Of course, Zizek is the main figure, and he always was, and um, everybody admires him. Uh, then, um, uh, actually, as it happened, uh, I think back when I was still a student, a structuralist movement was introduced to uh, Slovenia uh, by Slavoj Žižek uh, together with Rastko Mochnik, who was also uh, teaching not at the philosophy department but at the sociology department, and they both, in a way, stimulated each other in it. And they have first published papers in relation to French theory in our country, in Problemi. They were already there, yeah. And this is when, in the 70s? Yeah, yeah that's it. It was quite early and, you know, uh, along with translations of Freud, the translations of the texts of French theory were actually published in Problemi and elsewhere. The uh, situation with uh, Translating and publishing in our country is actually quite a nice one. We have a lot of journals and publishing houses, and this uh, tradition of uh, very careful translations, how to put it, which is very important for rereading of uh, Freud and of everybody else. Problem publishers in Slovenia? In Slovenia, yes. 
But later on, you know, things developed in different directions. So, um, uh, there are actually there are a lot of people who are engaged in this. Uh, should I say movement now in Slovenia? It's Mladen Dolar, it's Alenka Supanc, it's Rado Riha, Jelica uh, and then the younger generation, uh, Peter Klepet and. Lots of others. It's really quite a massive movement, how to put it. But everybody thinks of Slavoj Žižek as a major figure, as the leader, and uh, everybody is very happy when he appears, when he makes his appearance in Ljubljana, which is not so often, but hopefully that will change in the near future. That's the secret of happiness, is it? Get Slavoj Žižek to appear. <laughs> Well, our students would most definitely like to see him at least once a year. <laughs> yeah. Do you see any difference of themes between this younger generation and the founding generation of this work? Or is continuing in the same direction as before? Um, yeah, I think, it's I think it's in the same direction. It's perhaps just uh, uh, going uh, mm, how should I say, in the same direction, but more deeply. So we have this, you know, main, uh, we again have this main reliance on Hegel as a central figure. Um, but recently, yes, uh, some studies have been done in relation to Hegel as opposed to Spinoza. But what is really interesting, I was just thinking about it uh, recently, is that uh, the new generation of young philosophers, they seem to, mm, they, they're not so focused, how to put it, on reading Freud, on Lacan's return to Freud, on psychoanalysis and such. I actually had problems when I was getting together people, you know, to, in a way, get engaged in, in the context of this new university program. In, the program, the graduate program in uh, theoretical psychoanalysis. Then I realized, I, I was thinking, whom should I invite for what in relation to Freud, in relation to Lacan, in relation to whatever. And then I realized that most of the younger generation uh, of uh, what is actually generally considered as a very good, if not brilliant, young generation, are not really so much involved with psychoanalysis as a, some kind of you know central turning point in the history of philosophy and central conceptual apparatus which should be reread and reread and reread again. Because it's why, amazing. It's why amazing. Do you think that I, I, I really. Uh, I have to have a second thought about that, mm -hmm. yes, yes. I, I have to think it over. Just, of course, uh, as a coordinator, I wanted to invite everybody, but then I realized that, you know, if, if we started with a program on theoretical psychoanalysis, on psychoanalysis in relation to philosophy, it shouldn't be just about philosophy in, in, in relation to, to, I don't know, Anything else but psychoanalysis. I really have to, to think about it more thoroughly and should have done it already. We can come back to that later. This question of, of, of Hegel, why is there then still, with Marx, it's very clear since the 1920s, the, the rereading of Freud, of, that, of Marx, that's a particular, of Marx that, that it allowed, um, was massive revolutionary change in the history of ideas and, and further ideal political effects. But with, with Freud, it seems on the surface that the yeah. main influence has come from the Kantian tradition, uh, of Herbert, for instance, so an immediate mm -hmm. post-Kantian mm -hmm. in terms of the, the Freud's program and, and how its framework was put into place by Freud in the last two decades of the 19th century. Yeah. Why then is there this this, this stress on Hegel seemingly to the detriment of the post-Kantian tradition, 
other people in that tradition as well, for instance, uh, Ernst Kathira, you mentioned uh, another philosopher, Heidegger, but between Heidegger and Kathira there was a lot of uh, conflict and competition. Uh, the Heideggerian current won out in terms of popular esteem, but there is a, a, a philosopher, a post-Kantian philosopher, working on a theory of the symbolic and the forms of the symbolic, that it would seem would have some close affinities with, with Freud's research program. Why do you think there, there continues to be this stress on Hegel, possibly to the expense of mm -hmm. the Kantian tradition? Well, uh, one of the things which should be said is actually that um, Lacan relied on a certain reception of Hegel, mm -hmm. and our reception of Freud relies very much on Jacques Lacan, mm -hmm. and especially, uh, you know. Jacques Lacan, Jean-Paul Sartre, Simone de Beauvoir, and other intellectual figures of the time, they all attended Alexandre Coyer's lecture on Hegel's Phenomenology of the Spirit. And it was a major influence. It was extremely important for the structuralist movement as such, I think. And uh, it's also very important for, for Lacan himself. So. We talk about uh, a reading of philosophical reading of Freud. Uh, I should put it more precisely. Uh, in our country, it's Lacanian returning to Freud. So via Lacan, Lacan we have uh, Hegel, and then go back <laughs> and forth <laughs> to Freud. It would be extremely difficult to find to find any references in Freud to Hegel, wouldn't it? I mean, it's... Uh, yes, very. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Um. But, yeah, but on the other hand, you know, if there is a reception of certain movement in, in a certain country, there, uh, it might be a similar case, as I mentioned before, with the structuralist movement, as opposed to such, uh, it was a, a, uh, some kind of a, how should I say, characteristic. It was something they, they, that they could identify with. So that kind of point of identification in our country would be Hegel, Lacan with Hegel. And starting from that, everybody else, except Nietzsche. Yeah. <laughs> and again, this brings in this this tradition that is it stems from Paris in the 1920s and 30s with Coiré, Kochev, Cavalles and yes, others yes, that yes. brings with it the question of the relation between mathematics and psychoanalysis as well as the relation between science and psychoanalysis. Um, and unfortunately, yes, mathematics uh, uh, has not been actually taken into account in, in our reception of Lacan, I would say, yes. Uh, unfortunately, I hope that will change in the near future. And also, it might be uh, important that uh, it, we didn't take into account enough a psychoanalytic movement as such and all the proliferations of psychoanalysis in uh, Great Britain, all the uh, very well developed schools and interesting developments. Uh, of course, mm. the center figure of Melanie Klein should be, in a way, introduced into our work. Mm. And I'm very happy to be here and to have the opportunity of starting with it, <laughs> how to put it. It's, uh, she was extremely important for development of Jacques Lacan and, and his thinking. And uh, in a way, I have the impression uh, this is for me still a work in progress, but I just have the impression that Jacques Lacan didn't do justice to Melanie Klein. So I think it's very important to do it now and to introduce it to our way of thinking about Lacan and about Freud. And my guess would be uh, thinking about women's history in the place of women in history that's part of the problem with uh, Melanie Klein, the reception of Melanie Klein uh, would actually be the 
actually be related to the fact that uh, she was a woman. Okay, um, but it's just a hint I have to <laughs> think of it more thoroughly. It's just that, uh, for instance, as compared to uh, Winnicott, who was uh, so much put into the forefront by Lacan himself, and um, if I think of all the publications and the books which recently, also recently came out in France, uh, this uh, stress on Lacan and Winnicott is uh, perhaps not uh, so much, how should I say, counterbalanced with uh, taking into account Melanie Klein's work more as it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, perhaps I shouldn't talk too much about France, but it's actually very much true for our country. So I, I hope we can make that up in the near future. I think Melanie Klein was extremely important for, for Jacques Lacan. Mm -hmm. You mentioned it in one of your lectures. There are some six, uh, 70 or 80 quotations from Klein, or places where uh, in Lacan's work where he talks about her. But uh, we still have to work on that. And mm. I'm very pleased that you had these dialogues, Lacan-Klein dialogues in your right. There's been some work on documenting that relationship yeah. between Klein and Lacan in France, but yeah. it's little. And it's very important that we should, I think, uh, you know, coming from Ljubljana, I, sh I should open my eyes and see that there is something we just missed. <laughs> you know? I, I personally have the impression that this, you know, Sticking to Hegel is uh, very important, but it, it is just also something which is uh, a kind of a barrier. It took me years and years, you know, to, to get out of this paradigm. <laughs> if it's possible to get out of Hegel, you know, once you're there, it's very, I don't know. <laughs> it's not imaginable. It's, the essence of Hegelian thinking, once you're there, you can get out. <laughs> Michel Foucault made a very nice note about that. You know, the very moment you think you're out of Hegel, you finally got out, you, you should realize that you're still caught in the middle, how to put it. <laughs> yes, but since you mentioned mathematics, perhaps I should add uh, something about the how should I say, a major division between uh, the two trends in uh, the structuralist movement itself. On the one hand, you have this uh, relation to mathematics and to science and uh, um, French epistemology. And on the other hand, you have uh, another tradition which would much more rely on, how should I say, um, life. If, if I relate it to uh, philosophy in antiquity, uh, one tradition would be more on the side of Parmenides and the Eliots, and the other tradition would be more on the side of Heraclitus. Heraclit and, uh, of course, then Nietzsche and uh, Foucault and Deleuze in structuralist movement. So this was actually, in France, uh, a major, I think it was a major break between, uh, how should I say, the first, uh, the first period in which everybody was reading Marx and Freud and the formula Freud and Marx was really central was central for Claude Lévi-Strauss. He added geology <laughs> in his own uh, very interesting manner, tried to subvert it, the combination of the two. Freud and Marx, the formula was very important for Jacques Lacan himself. And of course, for Louis Althusser, who was the central figure of uh, rereading Karl Marx in, in France. But then, as it happened at a certain moment, um, Michel Foucault and Gilles Deleuze started to translate Nietzsche, or at least uh, they were the editors 
of the new edition of uh, Nietzsche in France, and they have written an introduction to the gay science, to Nietzsche's gay science, together. So it was a major break. And uh, since I, uh, you know, I actually have to present all the, uh, this tricky situation to my students, I started to think about this change uh, in relation to the reception of French theory in our country as well. That's why I'm so eager, you know, to see where Nietzsche stands uh, in relation to Freud, in relation to Lacan, in relation to, to Zizek, uh, in relation to anybody. Uh, And it really introduces again this theme that Lacan more and more concerned himself with uh, the one, if Parmenides is to be one part of this and how it led to the other. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of philosophical uh, research he's doing to formulate these programs and to discriminate them and then to place them in relation to developments in Lacan. Um, yes, actually. Well, it is very important to rethink, you know, how we can actually rewrite the whole history of philosophy using uh, Sigmund Freud as a major thinking figure, how to put it, conceptual persona. What is Freud for us and how should we rewrite uh, everything? And <coughs> But on the other hand, what is, what is really important for Zizek's work, I think, is, uh, is being able to move everywhere, from philosophy to popular culture, then to Lacan, and then to the present-day political situation, and so on and so on. It's really unique, I think. <laughs> I personally cannot follow him in, in or that directions. I, I, I'm more focused on rereading history of philosophy of poor Freud with a lot of help from Lacan. Because history of philosophy for us is, you know, the, the main way how we do philosophy. It's, uh, there's no other way. We don't have an object of philosophy like an object of science. And on the other hand, uh, we don't have a, a specific philosophical practice. We have to invent what would practice be. Uh, from that perspective, psychoanalysts, psychoanalysts are in a much better position. It's always very clear that psychoanalytical concepts relate very heavily with the psychoanalytic practice, psychoanalytic therapy, which is uh, a bit of a problem with psychoanalysis in our country because we don't have a tradition of uh, training psychoanalytic therapists. The general orientation of psychotherapy of, in our country would be uh, broadly psychodynamic, which would mean combining different approaches, different schools, different pragmatic solutions, how to put it. And the formation of uh, psychotherapists would be in hands of uh, our faculty for medical sciences, uh, partly and partly of uh, cl clinical psychology. So, uh, the, the idea of lay analysis in our country would not be a fav favorable one. Uh, in the break, we were talking a little about uh, uh, Jean Renoir and his relation to, to Lacan and Lacan's wife Sylvia. And the Renoir's book about his father, Auguste Renoir. Um, this question of father, we haven't yet looked in any detail at things of these in Freud and Lacan that play a central role in the development of the program of working in Sweden. Is the question of the father one of those themes or not? Um, yeah, perhaps we should try to think about it in that way, so what would be our paternal figures in theory, in intellectual space, uh, 
yeah, and how to understand the greatness of our major authorities out of Buddhism. Uh, because as Freud himself said, you know, the greatness of the great man, <laughs> as he put it, is not actually um, so much related to the products of his work as it is related to the fact that uh, there are some kind of some versions or some reincarnation of uh, the figure of the father. So perhaps we should work on that, you know, Hegel being our father for political reasons, for historical reasons, for uh, the reasons of identity in our reading of Lacan, Lacan through Hegel, it's a kind of a formula that has been around for such a long time that we should perhaps focus on that more thoroughly in the near future. About how to develop Hegel, whether to find uh, alternative programs um, and formulas. That, that is the point, yes, which all our respect to Hegel and all, all the tradition we belong to, uh, we should perhaps proliferate our thinking in other directions as well. As I've already mentioned, uh, Hegel, Nietzsche, <laughs> you could do both, but you know, uh, it's, uh, it's so um, symptomatic. On the one hand, in French theory, in French structuralism, there was such a strong stance against Hegel, actually against the free age of German philosophy. Hegel, Heidegger, Husserl. And here in Slovenia we have this reliance on Hegel, which is extremely important. It is extremely important historically, as I said, politically and theoretically. And yet with philosophical readings of Freud we should also get somewhere else as well, I think. That tradition we haven't mentioned explicitly before, the Heidegger uh, tradition phenomenology has had some impact in England in setting coordinates for research programs in psychotherapy, including psychoanalysis for psychotherapy. But mm -hmm. this theme, earlier you mentioned uh, Freud's um, revolution in science, and you indicated by that um, what Freud's work meant for uh, the condition of civilization and this theme in Freud's work of civilization generally. It's a theme that occurs in Freud and in Hegel and in Nietzsche. Could you say a little about this notion of civilization? Yeah, perhaps it could be. Uh, perhaps that could be actually one of the ways of doing it instead of, you know, moving towards and away from <laughs> some major figures and ideas, perhaps to find really a way how to put them together in a, a rather productive way. Uh, well, um, perhaps to start with Freud, uh, it was always Freud's idea, Freud's own idea that, you know, um, we have to think of uh, our civilization in, uh, and uh, its history uh, in relation to some major, how should I put it, not to simplify too much, epistemological breaks, which were much more than epistemological breaks. That's why Freud used uh, the uh, metaphor Copernicus, Darwin, and myself. So it would actually mean uh, some major breaks which were supposed to bring us somewhere higher, better, <laughs> uh, into a more advanced condition. And yet, uh, precisely the same big blows, as uh, Freud says, blows to uh, man, man's narcissism, actually has brought us also uh, how should I say, a much more darker side, uh, much more important step towards losing ourselves, towards, you know, 
decentralizing our own world. And uh, there is a kind of inherent negativity in, uh, from this point in our civilization, in our thinking. And that is actually what Freud has put into the center of his interest. And I think uh, this is going to be very thematic, but I do it in a way. You know, I think this uh, Nietzsche's main idea was also should I uh, introduce the word anti enlightenment in that connection? He didn't think about history as something which is making progress towards better and better, and, but he preferred to stick to genealogy, which would mean you know we have to look very thoroughly into this darker side of our history, which is not going to bring us any further, any higher, any better. It's, uh, it's very important to think of history through this uh, inherent negativity, the, the price we have to pay, which can be actually read um, uh, the way our bodies have been, the human bodies have been treated in history. This is actually the main idea of Foucault's reception of Nietzsche. So with Nietzsche we have this, in philosophy at least, we have this major break with the whole tradition of philosophy which was always on the side of the spirit, of the mind, of uh, reason, and so on and so on. On this side we have the whole elaboration of different notions and theories. And on the other side we have this, this uh, non-spiritual body side of history, which hasn't really been taken into account, but could have been taken into account uh, through rereading of Nietzsche course together with Freud, or really the move Freud together with Nietzsche. And that's a problem perhaps with Hegel, you know. It's, it's the, um, in Hegel, as in the whole long history of philosophy, there is no place for this other side of history, or other side of ourselves, which is, uh, how should I say, non-spiritualized one. What Freud really means for history and philosophy could be summarized with Nietzsche. I think Nietzsche always said, all oh, these philosophers, you know, they, uh, they spiritualize everything. They just cannot, cannot consider anything else than reason and soul and, and whatever. That again relates to this French tradition. Uh, oh, sorry, I said. <laughs> Coiré, in particular, was uh, working on this question of spirit and body in relation to Protestant mystics in France in the late uh, 1920s, and that influenced the way that these themes were taken up, the, the philosophical um, programs within psychoanalysis in France. Uh, this mm -hmm. genealogy of the darker side isn't something that characterizes, I think, the, um, the British uh, series of programs in psychoanalysis that you find in Britain. Um, if anything, again, one can yeah, say that the um, archaic in their own time starts to raise uh, that's the exactly the point. Of that question. Yeah. I think uh, Melanie Klein and her whole elaboration of uh, the notion of fantasy and of the object, as the state object, and uh, how to put it, or in a summarized manner, the negativity in the work of Melanie Klein is extremely important, and I, I, I presume it was extremely important for uh, for Lacan himself. I've been always wondering how actually Lacan, from the point of view of history of ideas, uh, came to the uh, the notion of the real, the real which is outside the symbolic, outside language, outside uh, the imaginary as well, and you know the the real which is seems to be the main. Uh, point, the central notion of his late uh, theory, of the later Lacan, how to put it. Although it was there already all the time, from, uh, was it 
53, I think. Not the measure in your literature. Explicitly. Yeah, explicitly. Yeah. yeah, it was there already. My first idea was when I have read an account through the lenses of history of ideas that it would partly, at least partly, be Jean Paul Sartre with his idea uh, of, you know, mm. nausea. And uh, when I read some feminist <laughs> essays on Sartre, you know, with his, this, his misogynist. A description of uh, the female body, of the breast, you know, and there's there are some quite, you know, very strong, how should I say, descriptions of the female body and such. So I got the impression first that it must be Sartre who was very influential uh, from the point of view, but uh, I think it uh, it might be the case uh, with Melanie Klein even more so. We shouldn't, you know, in our philosophical reading of Freud, we shouldn't rely too much on our philosophical tradition only. It's, uh, in a way, I, I myself look at it as a kind of a, uh, epistemological obstacle in which I've been caught. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and I hope to make it up in the near future, you know. We have to think about bringing together philosophical reading of Freud with uh, psychoanalytic movement as Freud has been, you know, received and reread and uh, reconceptualized in uh, different traditions in France, in Great Britain. It's, for me, it's really amazing, as I already mentioned, and I'll say it again, all this proliferation of psychoanalytic movement during decades in, in this country. I think this... Uh, is going to, in a way, help us to to do justice to Freud himself, actually. Uh, and that is something which I would really like to introduce to our new graduate programs in theoretical psychoanalysis. The, um, the, 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 the roots of that idea in, in Lacan were there for 20 or 30 years. We, Notions of imaginary and real in Merz and, and, and in Wallon. But yes. it's, it's, it's an interesting way of formulating it. How does this read in Lacan come to incorporate the, this theme of um, the dark side of mm -hmm. life? Mm -hmm. and there may be some, some dependency on that idea, but uh, uh -huh. how it comes well, I have to look for that. Yeah. I so, as I mentioned, it's a work in progress. It, it it's lovely, would it? be able to, to, to tell yeah. me more about it. I'd be grateful. From that, that perspective, from the very early years of, uh, of the, um, the 1930s, how Lacan is taking up that incline in relation to what later will become the real really interesting mm -hmm. Yeah, extremely interesting. It's just that, you know, uh, the problem and the notion on the theory of the real, or how to put it, is even more important for our country since, um, in a way, it has been generally admitted or considered that the Slava Zizek and uh, uh, Slovenian, or as he puts it, the Ljubljana, <laughs> Lukanian school, is supposed to be, in a way, related to the dimension of the real, to the order of the real. It was sometimes I read books in which uh, I can actually uh, realize that it was <laughs> nearly as that it was Slavoj Žižek who invented the notion of the real. <laughs> so it's, it seemed to be somehow, you know, for uh, the outside gaze, uh, Žižek and our reception of Lacan seem to be in a way closely related to the notion of the real. And, uh, yeah, some kind of uh, continuation of what was happening with the reception of Julia Kristeva first, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Her notion of the l'objet, the objective, or what the was the expression? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the object. But, but it was before translating uh, the later Lacan, wasn't it? Or uh, what would be the work on that, yeah. yes, but before that, the development of the notion of the importance of a late, late yeah, Lacan. Yeah. But this 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 vision of the Slavoj Zizek is something of a sonny lumière. It's not real, is it? <laughs> in, in the sense that a there were many other people 
course, yeah, yeah, yeah. introducing this team and working on it is substantially important. Uh, yeah. Other people, uh, yeah. Vlad and Dora, for instance? Yes, uh, well, he has written a very influential book on uh, not the, the gaze but the voice, mm -hmm. which is his major brief. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's extremely important and it's just very well accepted uh, everywhere, actually. Uh, my idea would be uh, that, you know, Mlade has written um, a book which was, uh, how should I say, in inherently Lacanian uh, and at the same time philosophical, introducing a lot of literary themes, and on the other hand, uh, um, the the dairy dairy aspect of it should be taken into account. So it's a book which I would consider uh, somewhere in between Lacan and Derrida. You know, it's the, Derrida's major topic, the problem of the voice, but it, it, it has been somehow twisted around a little bit. And uh, my personal perception is that uh, we might not be able to see the importance for instance, of the voice in Lacan himself, might not be we reading at the same time Jacques Derrida. I think it's very important to you know, have the whole constellation of the French theory uh, in mind all the time, actually. Uh, so it was because of the importance of Derrida, you know, in uh, the American reception of the French theory. At least partly, that you know, that, that was the case. But on the other hand, Lacan himself, I think, is uh, very much relying on the primacy of the gaze, and he explicitly, explicitly puts it that way. Perhaps he is too uh, philosophical and not enough anti-philosophical. Yes, <laughs> it's too much too philosophical yeah, and anti-philosophical. Yeah. yeah, and that was, I think, uh, what had. Realized uh, by reading Melanie Klein is that she might be very helpful in how should I say decentralizing this primacy in the whole long history of philosophy, the primacy of vision. You know, to see means to know, and to be the no most noble of the senses. And <laughs> of course, it turns out if I think of this darker side into. To see is to govern, you know, <laughs> to discipline the body, like in Foucault's panopticism and the whole story related to it. And uh, what was so nice for me to see in Klein is that, you know, what was uh, in, in, in Lacan and in Freud uh, related to, uh, first to the phallus, then to the anal phase, should I call it like that, aggressivity and, and so on. Uh, Melanie Klein was able to relate it to orality and to, to the earliest, what might be called the earliest stages of the Oedipus complex. So in a way, she didn't want to put something into the forefront. She, she in a way, would, would be able to help us to deconstruct you know, this hierarchical thinking. For instance, we have the hierarchy of the five senses in philosophy, in history of ideas, which is one of the main topics, and we don't realize that all the time we keep putting into the forefront the gaze. That's why I think that Mladen's book is very important to have this voice very nicely elaborated from political, philosophical, literary, uh, even for the end point of view. <laughs> yeah, that's, I, I think, you know, we should have, but you know, as philosophers, we are always, we are always, we are formed like that, and we are in a way conditioned to think about the higher <laughs> spheres, the gaze, the voice, you know, the gaze, <laughs> I don't know, of gods, <laughs> and, and so on. And uh, uh, if we might be able to put more uh, psychoanalysis, more Freud himself, more psychoanalytic movement, more Melanie Klein into our story, then we would have more orality, analogy, this bodily, you know, from philosophical point of view, uh, lower, how should I say, layers of our uh, identities or whatever. You've mentioned someone who is 
written a book on medical decline, Julia Kristeva. Uh, you've done a lot of work on feminism. Would you like to say a little about the, the background of that work and how it's developed in, in Sweden? Yes, uh, actually, well, uh, feminism in our country is related, of course, uh, to our history, which means that Slovenia used to be part of Yugoslavia, which used to be uh, a socialist country. Uh, and uh, the situation of women was actually better than in other countries. Of course, uh, it has to be mentioned in the context of uh, human rights, which were not better than in our con other countries, to put it mildly. But uh, uh, generally, uh, generally speaking, the position of women was better than in, uh, I would say, most of the European countries. And uh, one of the things which actually came out in uh, some of our European comparative research would be would show that quite clearly. And it still is like that. For instance, um, this is just the statistical data. <laughs> it's not related to psychiatrists, but anyway, anyway, I should mention it. Uh, there are much less uh, um, half-employed women in our country than in some West European countries, with the exception of North European countries, of course, and all the other things which go together with that. Uh, but on the other hand, women in intellectual life, women in philosophy, uh, women in psychoanalysis, it's uh, not as one might wish how to put it, and especially in, um, if I think of psychoanalysis, for instance, where traditionally uh, women were very much in position, how to put it, even if Freud himself, he was very in favor, you know, with, with uh, working together with his female colleagues and so on and so on. Also, if I remember the statistics for psychoanalysis uh, during the time I mean, the first part of the 20th century, let me see, uh, during the time where the, uh, in which the employment of women would generally be about 20% in psychoanalysis, it would be about 40%, something like that. So psychoanalysis would be in favor of, you know, this, uh, to go beyond that kind of divisions. And um, it's not like that now in our country. I see. Um, a lot of brilliant young uh, clinicians, clinical psychologists or psychiatrists around, you know, but uh, those who are in power uh, are not women, how to put it, <laughs> in the positions where you can decide what to do in psychoanalysis and how to direct the cure and so on. And in philosophy it's even worse, you know. There, uh, for instance, in our department, well, the situation is bad, I'm not going to into it too much, but um, to have more psychoanalysis in philosophy would also, in a way, mean, you know, to change the situation, to soften up the rigidity of philosophical tradition, and uh, as a kind of a um, side product, it could also mean bring more women in philosophy. For me, it's very hard to see all these brilliant female philosophy students, which I have, uh, which after they finish their studies, they somehow disappear. Either they uh, rather engage in some kind of artistic uh, practices or uh, would like to become practicing psychoanalysts. <laughs> which is very important, you know, but it's not something which could actually come instead of developing uh, your own philosophical position and becoming a philosopher of your own, how to put it. The women psychoanalysts in the late 1920s were producing a lot of work on the theme of the early Oedipus. Do you think that there are particular themes, particular insights, orientations that a woman can bring to psychological work that uh, you introduce this term, uh, softening rigidity? Yeah, uh, 
well, at least uh, I, uh, I wouldn't actually like to make the general conclusions, but um, history of women actually, in a way, shows us that you know women were able to make their contributions where they at least, how should I say, were admitted to do so. <laughs> That's why, you know, uh, I've mentioned already that for the 150th anniversary, I mentioned it to, it to you during the break or earlier, I've been invited uh, to give a, uh, an introductory talk at the Center Conference of the Society of Psychotherapists in Slovenia, which I was very honored, you know, I was so happy to, to be able to go there and to talk about Freud. But I was supposed to talk about feminine sexuality, not to talk about Freud in general, you know, what is Freud, who is Freud, what is the return to Freud, it was men's business, male business, how to put it. Of course, I mean, I was talking about female sexuality and <laughs> I, I uh, mentioned to turn things upside down from that particular partial perspective, but it somehow seems to be obvious, you know, it's self-evident that women should talk about female sexuality. And of course, then my main thesis was female sexuality doesn't exist. <laughs> well, we have to invent our own ways of, you know, managing through the Scylla and Charybda in long history of yeah. That's why, uh, well, if I may say so, um, for me it's very important and I try to, to work on that with my students as well, in this discussion, in this bringing together philosophy and psychoanalysis, uh, you know, to have this end uh, somehow broadened up, to, to, to open up the space which might be helpful. Um, and for me, it's feminism which can bring new perspectives yeah. against traditional philosophy and against specific reception of psychoanalysis in our country. Yeah. Okay. This, uh, this year, the 2006, the 150th, the 150th anniversary of Freud's birth. It was also the 100th anniversary of the birth of Kurt Gödel, uh -huh. and also someone from Vienna. Uh, and I think one of the journals that Slavoj Zizek used to um, produce was called Lohesva, a German language, and not a Slovenian language journal. Could you say finally just one or two things about this question of translation and affinity to German culture and affinity to English language culture. Voice um, War was actually the first international journal published by Slavoj Žižek and um, in the context of our reception of Lacan and perhaps it was not so much related to historical embeddedness in Central Europe and Austro-Hungarian Empire. I think it was more uh, the problem of the moment, or how to put it, the, uh, the possibility of the time, actually. Uh, otherwise it was... Uh, before that, uh, Slavoj Žižek developed to... Uh, decided to develop actually quite strong links, uh, links with uh, how should I say, Paris, <laughs> uh, Jacqueline Miller, and uh, uh, the psychoanalysis in, in, in France. And at a certain point, uh, Slava decided to uh, become part of that problemi, the journal problemi, the central, the Kenyan journal in Slovenia, uh, became some kind of, a, you know, joint edition of Le Champ Freudien, of the Freudian field. Uh -huh. yeah, so we have uh, several numbers of problemi with that explicit... This would be in the 1980s. Yes, yes. So it would be actually, you know, it wouldn't mean that uh, we would be more related to German tradition than to France or everything else. There are many things to go into there, but we need to come to a close.
Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much for inviting me and for this lovely conversation. Thank you, Audrey, for the introduction.